Ashley, would you come forward, please? Our scripture I'm giving this morning is from Proverbs chapter 10, verses 15 and 16. The wealth of the rich is their fortress. I think we have to look out for that in our society. That, that we don't look to what we have as what we lean on, depend on. The poverty of the poor is their calamity. The earnings of the godly enhance their lives, but evil people squander their money on sin. Interesting. Amen. Again, Lord, we come in the name of Jesus. So grateful that you set us free to give. And that you've made a part, us a part of your work in spreading your kingdom, your salvation, the love of Christ. Thank you, Lord, for using our church, for using us, even our kids, Lord. We're grateful. So please receive our tithes and our offerings today, and they bring you glory. In Jesus' name, and the church said, Amen. 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 <coughs> Continue our series on the keys to understanding history. How many keys are there? Seven. Seven. Very good. <clears throat> Let's see how we do this week on remembering the keys. All right. First key. What is it? Creation. Right. How can you understand history without knowing who the creator is? Amen. And the second key is corruption. Very good. God made everything perfect, but somebody messed up. Huh? We did. And it corrupted everything here. The third key is catastrophe. Yep. Uh, this earth is like it is today. Most physically because of this catastrophe. And what was that catastrophe? It was the flood. The flood. Amen. And the fourth key is... The chosen, the chosen people, Israel, the apple of God's eye, watching them. We learn a lot about God by watching history. The fifth key to history is Christ, right? And Christ is, I didn't say this last week, but Christ is the master key. That's a good way of looking at it, isn't it? We looked at him last week as our prophet, the prophet. We need him as our prophet. There's lies all around us in this world. We need to know what the truth is and so in every area of life. And God has spoken to us the truth and he's given it to us through Jesus, the prophet. And today we're looking at Jesus. If you don't mind talking about Jesus another Sunday, do you? Okay. That's you might like. He's your favorite guy, isn't he? Our Lord and our Savior, amen. There is no name like Jesus. There are no songs like songs that bring that mention the name of Jesus. Our Jesus. Today we're going to look at Jesus as our priest. Our high priest. If you remember, a prophet is someone who uh, speaks for God to people. Jesus has spoken the truth to us. As the prophet and priests are those who represent people to God. And that's what Jesus does for us. He's the only way to reach God. Us through Jesus to God. It's the only way for us uh, to reach God. It's the only way for us to get to heaven is Jesus. Do you think you can meet God's holy standards and get into heaven on your holy standards? Now, his standards are so far and high above ours, no way we can even get close to earning our way, being good enough to get into heaven. The standards for getting in are way above us, aren't they, church? Amen. <clears throat> 
But praise the Lord, we've got Jesus as our high priest to get us there. He makes us right with God, and he keeps us right with God. Now that's important to realize. It isn't just what Jesus has done in the past, but it's what Jesus as our high priest is doing for us right now. He keeps us right with God. Let's pray. Father, we do appreciate what you've done in giving us your son Jesus and all that he means to us. And he's so much more than we could ever know. And today we ask, Father, for new revelations on who he is. For us personally, for us as humanity, Give us a new revelation of Jesus today, our Jesus, and use it to help us to appreciate him more and more. Now please anoint this teacher to be faithful to your word. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. The church says, Amen. Amen. Now under the old covenant, back in history, the Israelites were given the law. We talked a little bit about the law last week. And if you remember, the law was powerless to make anyone right with God. So, so no one could keep all the laws and meet all those holy standards of the law and get into heaven. Just they weren't, no one was able to do it. No person, no human has ever been able to do that. So the law cannot make anyone right with God. If you're looking for that to be your way in to heaven by being just a good person, following all the laws, you're not going to get there. It isn't going to happen. <clears throat> so what did the law do? The law showed people their sins. Let's look at Romans chapter 3. We're going to start at verse 20. There is a purpose for the law. No one can ever be made right with God by doing what the law commands. How many can be made right with God by following the law? No one. The law simply shows us how sinful we are. How does it do that? Well, let's, let's go on. Verse 21. Now God has shown us a way to be made right with Him without keeping the requirements of the law. But we weren't going to make it by following the law, were we, brothers and sisters? Wasn't going to happen. So He showed us a way to be right with God without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes, no matter who we are. You remember, I probably told you about my dad. Um, I was probably one of the first ones saved in, in my family. We were all a bunch of fosters and good riches, a bunch of heathens. Um, and dad was one of the last ones that came to the Lord. He put off coming to the Lord for years. Uh, one night he was loaded and and he got, I got him to open up. He was a little loose. He gave him to me a little better that night. And he, and he gave me the truth of why he, he hadn't invited Christ into his heart. And the truth was this. He says, God could not accept me now. He couldn't love me. He says, I've lived. He was in his 70s. He said, I've lived my whole life ignoring him. And, and just doing whatever I want, rebelling against him. He said, I've done awful things in life. No way God could ever forgive me that he could ever love me. But is that what we just read, church? Well, that was a lie. The devil was lying to him. Bless God. He, he finally believed the truth that everyone who believes in Jesus Christ can be saved. 
be made right with God. Everyone. All right, so the law, that was Old Testament. Uh, the Ten Commandments are, are like uh, all the laws put together into ten, if you will. Can we use the Ten Commandments today? Are they useful today? Do you? What for? Well, let me give you a, a purpose for the Ten Commandments today. The, the commandments of God reveal His holiness, right? He says, here's what God is like, and if you're going to follow God, here's what He commands, what He demands of you. Uh, and then, as we looked at those standards, we realized, I can't do that. And I, I, I can't make that. Well, the Ten Commandments are still used the same way today. The Ten Commandments, as unbelievers hear those commands, they realize, uh, I've broken those. You just think of the commandments. I'll put nothing else before me, before God in my life. Anyone ever put anything before God in their life? Oh boy. Or remember the Sabbath. Keep it holy. Honor thy, thy mother and father. Uh, don't commit adultery. And if you have sex before you get married, you've actually committed adultery against the spouse that you would have, that you'll have later on because you have. Or don't covet what your neighbor has, his property, his wife. Don't lie. None of us ever lie here. Uh, don't steal. You see, even today, you and I can be and should be using the law, the Ten Commandments, as an example of the law, in order to witness. Because as we share the law with people, it helps them see that they've, that they've rebelled against God, broken God's laws, and they need forgiven. So the law helps prepare people to receive Jesus. Then they see their need for a Savior. Someone to help them. So the law is still very useful, is to be used today. Yep, and then we tell them about the love of Christ. All right? They've got to know that they need Jesus. And the law helps do that, helps them to see they need him. Now, under, under that old covenant, where they were supposed to follow the laws, you remember what they were to do when they broke the laws? Israelites under the old covenant. Remember, they were to take, uh, uh, they were to have sacrifices. They take animals or grain offerings or liquid offerings. Uh, give them lambs, sheep, and sheep and goats, and uh, they had animal sacrifices. We look, we think about that now. We think, well, that's pretty backward. You know, that, that's pretty bloody. That's well, there was a point to that. It was to show that sin. Sin is bad stuff. And that's why these that's why these animal sacrifices. But even at that, those animal sacrifices couldn't provide perfect cleansing from sins. The animal sacrifices could not remove guilt. I don't know about the rest of you, but when, when before just before I came to the Lord. And I was really realizing what a sinner I was. The guilt on my mind was so heavy and so powerful and so strong. You've been there, church? Even as believers, when I when I sin against the Lord, that guilt comes upon my mind. And it's an awful thing to have that. And you know God doesn't want that guilt in our minds? He wants to free. We were saying about being free. He wants to free us from any guilt, from heavy conscience. The law could not do that. The animal sacrifices could not do that. But Jesus does. He saves us and even sets our consciences Amen. free. Hallelujah. Now back under that old system again, if the Israelites, those who were humble, the Israelites who were humble brought sacrifices because of having contrite, repentant hearts, sorry for breaking the laws, and then they received 
temporary forgiveness from God. Just temporary with those animal sacrifices. Now don't you think though there were some Israelites that brought their animal sacrifices and other sacrifices who really weren't sorry for breaking the law? You know, just like people today. But they brought their sacrifices because that was what they're supposed to do anyway. You think they were forgiven even that little temporary for that temporary time? No. No. It takes a contrite and humble heart, just like today. And, and whether they were sorry for their sins or not, under that old system, they still had to bring back sacrifices again. And again. And again. And then the following year. And then the next festival. They had to keep doing it again. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10. This is going to be our key book here this morning. Hebrews 10 verses 3 and 4. Those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. Yeah, of course, if you're going to keep going back there to the temple and taking your sacrifices there year after year, you're reminded year after year of your sinfulness. Verse 4, For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It's not possible. Possible. So the purpose of the law was to make them sin conscious. It did not clean them or clean their minds of guilt. And you know that's exactly what God wanted? He wanted people to be sin conscious because He was preparing them for a better sacrifice. Amen. Let's read on here in Hebrews 10, starting at verse 5. That is why when Christ came into the world, he said to God, and this is Jesus talking to the Father, you did not want animal sacrifices or sin offerings, but you have given me a body to offer. Jesus was given a body by the Father, knowing He was to be the sacrifice. You were not pleased with burnt offerings or other offerings for sin. Then I said, when He realized why the Father was giving Him this body, of course He knew it before the creation, but He responded to the Father, Look, I have come to do Your will, O God, and as it is written about me in the Scripture. He says, I am willing to sacrifice this body that you have given me. I am well. Zeleucus was a man who lived about 500 B.C. He was the head of a country. His government over the Locrians was severe but just. In one of his decrees, he forbade the use of wine unless it were prescribed as medicine. And in another decree, he ordered that all adulterers should be punished with the loss of both their eyes. When his own son became subject to this penalty, the father, in order to maintain the authority of the laws, but to show parental leniency, shared the penalty with his son by ordering one of his own eyes to be thrust out along with one of his offending son. True story. In this way, the majesty of his government was maintained and his own character as a just and righteous sovereign was magnified in the eyes of his subjects. Now that made me think of our God and how uh, our God is a just God, which means every sin will be paid for, will be punished. Every sin, large and small, 
because our God is just. He must do that because he's perfect and he's perfect in justice. But he is also merciful like this king had shown to, to his son by gouging out one of his own eyes. Yeah, the penalty was paid, but mercy was shown. And that points to our God who shows even much more mercy as he's given up his own son. So God is a balance of justice and mercy. His justice is tempered with mercy. And aren't we glad? Somebody say amen. Amen. Oh boy. Now, animal sacrifices. That must have been smell. Anyone in here playing deer or or other game or, or hogs or and you open them up, it is smelling. And you imagine what it would have smelled like doing animal after animal after animal in the temple. You have blood and guts everywhere and, and death, the smell of death everywhere. What's God trying to point out there? Sin is bad stuff. He said, don't do it. Even that, with the animals, they were not proper sacrifices. Think about it a moment. None of the animals were perfect. Every one of those animals that they used, they all had some type of blemish, didn't they? As part of this earth, everywhere on this earth, everything is blemished. <clears throat> so none of the sacrifices were perfect. But also, the, sac the animals were not equal in value to humans. The animals were being sacrificed because of human sins. So it's the people who actually should have been dying, shedding their own blood, being punished and paying for their sins. Instead, animals were sacrificed and substituted instead. And, a, and an animal does, is not nearly equal in value to a human, no matter what the liberals say. They're not even close in value to humans. So it wasn't, animals were not good sacrifices. What humans need and needed was a perfect human sacrifice. That alone would truly take care <coughs> of the punishment uh, due for sins. But there's never been any humans like that. Even Adam and Eve in the beginning. No one. There are no perfect humans. So there are no sacrifices. Perfect sacrifices for anyone else. Some may have thought, well, why couldn't so 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 and so been a sacrifice like Jesus? They couldn't. Because they were not perfect, they deserved to be punished for their own sins. So they couldn't be a substitute for someone else because they, they themselves deserved to punish. And yet we still need a perfect human sacrifice. So God provided one. Jesus. Okay. What was Jesus' life like before he came here as a human? You ever, you ever think about that? Yeah, he was, he is God. Fully divine. In uh, John 17, in verse 5. Jesus said to the Father, Bring me into the glory that we shared before the world began. Jesus, in the glory, full glory of God, He as God, having the full glory of God, Jesus was full of divine glory and power before the creation because He is God. Listen, church, it took me many years before I finally got a hold of this. Jesus gave up his divine qualities to become our proper sacrifice. Because we needed a fully human sacrifice. And in order to do, to do that, he had to give up his divine qualities. 
Philippians chapter 2. If you're going to remember any scriptures today, this is the one I think the Lord would have you remember. Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 through 8. Though, now we're, we were praying to ask God for new revelations about our Jesus today, right? For some of you, this is probably going to be it. Though he was God, he did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. He wasn't going to say, I'm God, I'm not going to go down there. <laughs> he didn't think like that. Seven. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges. He took the humble position of a slave. He was born as a human. So did, was he giving up his uh, divine privileges? He sure was. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Now I want to take you back to verse 7. He gave up his divine privileges. This process in the church is called the kenosis. That's a Greek word. The kenosis. Can you say that with me? The kenosis. That starts with a K. And kenosis means to empty. Jesus emptied himself of his divine qualities, which meant when he came here as a man, he was no longer omnipotent. He did not, he got rid of the power he had as God to be all powerful. He set it aside. He gave up his own divine quality of omniscience, which means he knew everything as God. He gave that up when he came down here as a man and was no longer omniscient, knowing everything. As, as God, divine before the creation, he was omnipresent. God is a spirit everywhere, all at the same time, in different times. Omnipresent. He gave that up. He emptied himself of his own divine qualities when he came here as a human. He willfully humbled himself to the limitations of humans. He willfully humbled himself to the limitations that you have as a human. So, Whatever you cannot do as a human, along with other humans, he put his own limits right there with yours and mine. Is that coming through? Amen. Are you getting a hold of that a little bit? Took me for took me a while to, uh, to really uh, understand what Jesus has done there. Now, some of you are thinking, well, wait a minute. But he was here as a man and he walked on water and he healed the sick and he made the storm stop. He fed 5,000. He did all kinds of other miracles, didn't he? When he was here as a man, what do you mean he gave up his divine qualities? And also, didn't he tell people things uh, without them having to talk to him that he knew they were thinking? So, so he was, he was able to know things that, that were, uh, there was no way of knowing in, in, uh, just with human qualities. So, so if he gave up all of his uh, divine powers then, how did he do all that stuff? He did it the same way that you and I do or can or is made available to us. He did it by the power of the Holy Spirit, not his own power. See, I used to think, well, I'm supposed to live like Jesus, but Jesus was God, so there's no way I can live like Jesus. And then I learned later on this truth. Yeah, but Jesus, he gave up all his divine qualities. He didn't use that God power when he came here as a man. He depended on the power of the Holy Spirit to do what he did here for God. The Holy Spirit, He is the same one who gives us power to serve and to please God here in this life. 
So the scene, remember when Jesus was baptized? It says the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove. That's when he received the Holy Spirit with power so that he could fulfill his ministry here on earth. He did that because as fully man, he's showing how we are supposed to be able to serve God here in this earth. The same way, by the same power, the power of the Holy Spirit. He's the one who gives us our abilities. And even in the supernatural realm, if God calls us and wants to use us in that way. Praise the Lord. So, by the Holy Spirit in prayer, that's how Jesus operated. The same, He had the same limitations as us, and that's how we operate. In all ways, see, church, Jesus became like us. I was sitting at a Bible study and was teaching this to a Bible study group one night. And one lady who was there was a leader of the church. And I see the light come on. And it hit her. She said, he, he gave up his divine qualities? He really did become like me. I can't use that old excuse. He's God. No, he became fully like me. And, and then she thought about it some more and she started weeping. And she said, oh, what he's done for me. How far has he lowered himself for my sake? For me? Oh, thank you, Jesus. The Christ, he emptied himself. Now I want to ask you another question. Have you ever thought of this? Did he think like or even know he was God when he was a child or maybe even a baby? Did he know he was God? I mean, did he pop out of the womb doing miracles? Did he read his mother's mind? You know, by the power of the Holy Spirit? When, when he was one year old? There's a... Uh, anyone ever heard of the Apocrypha? Sure. And you know, there's... In the, some uh, churches like the, uh, the Greek and the Catholic churches... They have uh, our Old Testament, our New Testament, and another set of books in the middle called the Apocrypha. We don't accept them uh, because we don't believe that they're uh, straight from God. And, and one reason is, one of those books has Jesus, the little guy, doing miracles as a child. It didn't happen that way. He wasn't born knowing that he was God. Remember, he gave up all those God qualities. But by the time he was 12, he realized who he was. And, and that's the reason why the Jews uh, have the boys uh, at age 12 then become a member. That's why we in the Methodist Church and other churches, we wait till kids turn 12 or 13 before they're allowed to be members and take responsibilities and in the church, uh, because when Jesus was 12, he realized what he was there for and who he was. Let's look at that a moment. Luke chapter 2, starting at verse 49. Now what was going on here was uh, Jesus' parents were loved God. And if you, if you were a Jew in those days, you had to go to the major festivals in Jerusalem. Uh, three times a year. One of those festivals was Passover. And so they had come, along with many other people from their family and from their community in Nazareth, down to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover for a week. Eight days. And they all, and when it was over, they all, the caravan got together and they're headed up north again. Mom and Dad realized, Jesus isn't here. Where is it? They couldn't find him anywhere in the caravan. And so... They said, we better go back to Jerusalem. Maybe he's still back there. So they went back to Jerusalem. Three days, they're hunting all over the city, trying to find Jesus. And where did they find him, church? In the temple. That's where we pick it up here. They found him in there, and he said, But why did you need to search? Didn't you know that I must be in my Father's house? He realized, finally who he was, 12 years old. But 
they didn't understand what he meant. Then he returned to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. And his mother stored all these things in her heart, just like good moms do with, about their kids. Now look at this next, next verse. Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and all the people. See the phrase, the first part of verse 52? Jesus grew in wisdom. He didn't start out wise. He had to grow in wisdom. He got wiser and wiser as he got older. Just like we do. Hopefully. <laughs> he grew in wisdom. So he, didn't, he wasn't born as a kid knowing that he was God. He, he grew up just like you grow up. Fully human. With the limitations that humans have. He humbled himself in this way. So he could become the proper human sacrifice. So he could die for you. First Peter uh, chapter 2. Let's go down to verse uh, 22. First Peter 2, 22. <clears throat> he never sinned. Nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted, nor threaten revenge when he suffered. And you? He left his case in the hands of God, who always judges fairly. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross, so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. But his wounds, by his wounds, you are healed. See, that this is really, this, by wounds you're healed, that's really in reference to salvation we can see. Many people use it for healing, but it's the application to salvation. Once you were like sheep who wandered away, but now you have turned to your shepherd, the guardian of your, of your souls. Amen. Like you and I, Jesus grew up and suffered the mistreatment from other people. He grew up in a family. He had siblings. You think it was all fine in his family? Uh, did he have some problems there? Were there others in the neighborhood that might have been hard to, uh, that were hard on him? Um, he had a mom and dad. He had to obey. He understood exactly what you and I, from baby on up, he went through it all. But unlike us, he did not retaliate in kind or even desire any revenge because that would be sin. He was the perfect sacrifice to suffer the punishment that we deserve. If he had sinned at all, he couldn't be our sacrifice because then he deserved to die for his own sins. See, He had to be perfect, and he did it. In his human body, he carried our sins then. Can you imagine the pain that he had to suffer when he went to the cross? If you would tally up all of your sins and think of the punishment that each one of them deserved and think of receiving all, all of that punishment at the same time, I can't imagine just the pain for my sins. Well, that, would, that would be suffering, that I would have, should be suffering. But he took the pain of my sins, your sins, the punishment for everyone's sins over the whole world, all through history past and through the present, right? the future, present and future. He took that suffering for all of those sins because God is just, he had just like the, 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 the eyes that had to be poked out. Someone had to have eyes poked out. That was the law back then. Because God is perfectly just, every single sin must 
be paid for with the punishment it deserves. And Jesus took it all. I cannot imagine the pain that he had to go through. Oh my. And why did he do that? To provide forgiveness and freedom for you and for me. Our redemption comes through Jesus. Amen. Jesus alone. He was alone when he went to the cross, wasn't he, church? But his sacrifice wasn't confined to just here on this earth. It wasn't just something happening on earth. Uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 and 12. So Christ has now become the high priest over all the good things that have come. He has entered that greater, more perfect tabernacle in where? In heaven, which was not made by human hands and is not part of this created world. With his own blood, not the blood of goats and calves, he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever. Thank you, Lord. Because his sacrifice was perfect, then he didn't have to be sacrificed over and over again. And like the uh, priest in the Old Covenant, in Israel's days, who went into the most holy place uh, to, to, uh, for sacrifices, Jesus, our high priest, has entered the most holy place with the blood of the sacrifice required because... We broke God's laws. He entered that tabernacle with the blood from the sacrifice that was required. But he entered in, not into the temple in the earthly Jerusalem, but he entered into the heavenly temple in the true Jerusalem. He entered into that temple carrying his own blood. You with me, church? Why? And when, when he did that, he probably said something like this. Father, here is the blood of the sacrifice. His own blood. This proves the punishment for mixed sins and your sins was taken. I, Jesus, as a man, carried them. And God, our judge, accepted Jesus' sacrifice. Thank you, Lord. Jesus' sacrifice was perfect. So it did, again, cover all the past, present, and future sins for all humans ever born. Uh, Hebrews 9, 24 and 25. For Christ did not enter into a holy place made with human hands, which was only a copy of the true one in heaven, so what Solomon built in the temple, that was a copy of the temple in, in heaven. He entered into heaven, Jesus did himself, to appear now before God on our behalf. He did not enter heaven uh, to offer himself again and again, like the high priest here on earth who enters the most holy place year after year with the blood of an animal. He didn't have to because his sacrifice did it. It was a perfect one. No blemishes. Fully human. Thank you, Jesus. It was a better sacrifice than goats and calves. It was offered with better blood in a better temple, which is why it was made once for all. And as our high priest, he continues to, to, to be there on your behalf, ever interceding for you and for I. Do you realize that? Even now, every day, Jesus is at the right hand of the Father as your high priest, and he is interceding for you when you mess up before the Father. He says, Father, I paid for that sin that just did this morning. And then when you do it again, the don't do it, no, he's going to do that, because it just means that just means he had to suffer more. You're with me. But he's our, your high priest right now. Every day, interceding for you. His 
sacrifice is sufficient to pay for the sins of the entire world. But people must appropriate that sacrifice individually by placing their faith in Jesus alone. I'm going to close with, with one story, true story. A Japanese soldier by the name of Choichi Yokoi lived in a cave on the island of Guam uh, to which he fled in 1944 when the tides of war began to change. After the first service, one of the guys came to me and said, I was there on Guam, I heard about that guy. Afterwards. Fearing for his life, he stayed hidden for 28 years in the jungle cave, coming out only at night. 28 years, that means up to what year would that be? 44, 28, 1972, is that about right? I remember. Yeah. True story. During this self-imposed exile, he lived on frogs, rats, snails, shrimp, nuts, and mangoes. Even when he figured out the war was over, he was afraid to come out for fear he would be executed. Two hunters found him one day and escorted him to freedom. He was living all this time under the indictment of sins that had all been dealt with, sins of the, his, his nation. But he simply had not appropriated the atonement that was available. You see what he, what he did, church? He was free in 1945 to go and live his life free. But he didn't know it. He had appropriated what happened himself personally. And so he stayed in, the, in bondage for, for till 1972. That's the way it is with the unsaved today. Jesus has already paid for everyone's sins out there. They've already been paid for. Everyone's. It's ta they're taken care of. But it does them no good until they personally appropriate Jesus' sacrifice for themselves. Till they accept Jesus themselves. Now, who's going to tell them their sins are paid for? Sure. Who's going to tell them? Who's going to tell them? Put your hand up if you're willing to be used of the other hand. Mike says, oh, that's what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> who's going to tell them? You and I. Your sins have been paid for. Just put your trust in the one who did it. And then you're free. Not only will you be forgiven, remember this earlier in the message? Your conscience will have the weight lifted off. And you remember when that happened to you the first time? That your, your guilt was taken away and your conscience was clean? That's what Jesus does. Would you buy that with me, please? Oh, Father. Blessed Father, I want to thank that you gave up Jesus, that you sent him down here knowing what he's going to have to go through, leaving his divine qualities, taking all the abuse, dying, suffering the punishment for every sin that man has ever committed. Father, thank you for giving your son up for us. And we thank you, Jesus, for your willingness, your obedience. It's because of you and you alone, Lord Jesus, that we can get into heaven, that we can get to God. And because of that, we give you our lives. And if there's anyone in here, heads bowed and eyes closed, who've never done that, who've never appropriated what Jesus did on the cross for yourself personally. Your sins are forgiven. If you've never done that, just say, Father, forgive me. Right now where you are, just whisper unto him. Sometime come to the altar with that. If you've never come to the altar, come before him and tell him, I am a sinner. Please forgive me. I trust what Jesus did as covering my sin. Take away my guilt. Clear my conscience. Set me free. And if you backslid at one time, you're, you know right now you're not where you used to be with God.
you want to get back there again, even in a closer relationship, start that this morning. Putting your trust again in Jesus' death for you and what he has accomplished for you. Ask for forgiveness again. Be restored. Let him know. Whisper it to him out loud right now. And then tell others the decisions you've made to put your faith in Jesus Christ. That proves it's real when you tell others. Amen. Everybody said, Amen. Amen.